one. Um, we've got a voting session today, work session slash voting session. We've got two pieces of legislation to consider. Before we get started, I want to first, uh, I think this is the first time we've been together um, as a committee other than on Zoom. And I wanted to uh, acknowledge and welcome uh, Senator Young, who uh, has, has joined us. I'm obviously no stranger to any of us, um, but uh, we'll welcome him to the committee. And Senator Quarterman, who uh, is the uh, new Washington County Senator, and uh, we're very fortunate to have him uh, with us uh, on the committee. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to get started. We're going to do these two bills. Uh, the first one will be Senate Bill 1, the HBCU bill, and I believe uh, well, is uh, someone going to give just a quick update on the status of it? And I think we have at least one amendment. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I can uh, post the reprint with that amendment that has been submitted by Senator Griffith. Uh, this is the HBCU bill. It's very similar to the one that you passed last year, which was vetoed by the governor. Um, this is the bill that does many things. Um, to keep it brief, it establishes a funding, um, additional funding in the amount of $577 million over 10 years for the HBCUs, all contingent on settlement of the current lawsuit. Um, what is different from last year is that the money here you can see um, in this section on line 23, a floor, a minimum amount of funding has been established for each year, and that's $9 million. Um, some of the other provisions um, still deal with establishing a group within MHEC to look at uh, program approval. It establishes um, the current Center for Academic Innovation to work on some things. There's a report due by December 1st, 2021 on the academic program approval process. Um, the HBCUs are encouraged to hire a consultant on programmatic development. That would also be due December 1, 2021. And the HBCUs are encouraged to use the funds that they would receive under this act to support and implement the blueprint for Maryland's future. Um, all provisions, except for the funding provisions, um, will go into law after the bill is passed. Uh, the Section 1 funding provisions are the ones that are contingent upon settlement. The amendments um, basically deal with providing a potential um, way to save general funds. Uh, this relates to the Cigarette Restitution Fund and the ongoing litigation that's happening um, with the, with the, um, the non-participating members in the CRF. So basically what this language says is if that should come to fruition and decide in the state's favor, um, then any funds that are currently in an escrow account, and currently that's $243 million, um, would instead be used to supplant the general funds that are otherwise required under this bill. So potentially saving some general funds. That is the amendment. I also have many requests to add sponsors to the bill. It's just in the bill one. And then okay. Um, so first off, just a, a point because it's been raised to me. I want to make sure that it's clear uh, with regard to the cigarette restitution fund. These are dollars that would be new dollars. They are not um, dollars uh, currently from what is already received and already programmed for other purposes. So it will not touch any of that. This is just new dollars that still are part of what uh, – was the uh, I guess the arbitration or the, the what was going on litigation going on um, for years for yeah. the final non-participants? When she said non-participants, those were companies that didn't join as a, a major participant in the in the uh, the original litigation and the uh, original settlement. So these are the individuals who are or the individual companies, and so that their contribution um, was yet to be resolved and that's what this litigation is uh, is about so um, uh, Senator Griffith did you have anything more you would add to your amendment 
No, I was just waiting for you to entertain a motion, and then I'd be happy to make one. Okay. <laughs> uh, any further discussion on the amendment? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Actually, do we need a roll call? Only if you think we do. Um, uh, all those in favor, raise your hand. Is that you? I can't even see. Everybody's in favor? It's unanimous. Senator King? Yep. Okay. Yep. So note that Senator King raised her hand as an aye. Um, I have uh, an amendment that would add uh, the actually entire Democratic caucus that no longer is, uh, that is not originally on the bill. I would ask if there are Republican members who wish to be added to that amendment. Yep. I have an, uh, an email from Senator Edwards to add himself, Senator Rosa, Eckert, Saling, Simon Air, and West. Okay. All right. Um, so if we can just maybe put that all in one amendment. Yep. Um, and then uh, is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Okay. Um, great. All right. Uh, now on uh, final pas passage. Chairman, yes. Question. Please. Yeah, I just want to understand how the contingency is going to work now because that obviously got screwed up because of the veto. I just like to understand sure. the timing and mechanics of the contingency. Senator Griffith or, or one of the analysts, whoever wants to talk about that. I, I think I'm guessing you're saying. Your question is, since we don't know exactly when that money would become available based on the settlement, the, the settlement then how does it function into uh, the, uh, the, the payments that need to go out on an annual basis? Yeah, I mean, my understanding of the bill we passed last time, the governor vetoed, and my understanding of this bill, is the money is contingent on the settlement. Okay. It's, and, it's and contingent that, on the settlement by June 1 of this year. Okay, so th th that was question number one. So, so if there's no settlement by June 1, I'm, I'm not saying there won't be. I hope there is. <laughs> I'm just saying if there isn't one by June 1, something gets screwed up in some way, what, what happens then? So what happens then is all of the funding provisions that I described um, will not take into effect, but the other provisions about the various studies, um, hiring a consultant, the Kerwin Center for Academic Innovation, those do still go into effect regardless of what happens with the settlement. Okay, and we'd have to come back next year and deal with the Correct. issue again. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. um, so just I, actually <laughs> to clarify what I thought was your question, because I think it's worth mentioning, um, this idea of how does that money uh, come into the process, and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is it just simply that um, there is an allotment that needs to come in every year, and that would come out of the general fund. And should there be the settlement money, that would take the place of using the general fund money in any given year across the, the, the time span. Is that correct? So the bill establishes a special fund. So um, they, the governor would need to include in the annual budget an appropriation into the special fund um, of the full amount, and then over the 10 years, the allotments come out and go to the institutions. And then any, any unspent funds go back into the special fund. The two different yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, on final passage. So moved. All those in favor, raise your hand. It's uh, unanimous. All right. Okay. Very good. Very important. Really good stuff. Thank you to everybody who worked on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Here, here. Um, all right. Uh, we're going to move on to the Relief Act. And as you know, this is uh, essentially, in some ways, two parts. The, the aspects that the governor proposed in this act, and then the recovery now fund that we've added to the act. Um, so um, let's go through uh, each point. You want to start with the, 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 
Yeah, you want to go the, particularly the relief act. I mean, the the governor's stuff first. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will give an overview of um, uh, Senate Bill 496. Um, and there's there's six main provisions to the bill, and we can drill down as necessary. Um, but the, the bill provides uh, economic relief payments for, for taxpayers who receive the earned income tax credit in 2019 and 2020. Those would go out in two separate payments. Um, the bill exempts from both state and local tax, local income tax, the um, unemployment insurance benefits received by an individual. That begins in tax year 2020. Um, the, the bill authorizes um, certain businesses that, that um, um, collect sales and use taxes on their sales to retain up to a certain amount of uh, sales and use tax. It's called a vendor credit. Um, it's both. Uh, before they remit the, the um, money back to the comptroller, they, they'd be allowed to retain up to a, a certain amount each month. Um, and the, uh, the bill um, adjusts the unemployment insurance um, structure um, for, um, to exclude fiscal 2020 and 2021. Um, employers calculate their um, unemployment insurance benefit payments to the state um, based on their uh, their experience and how many layoffs they've had so it would it would exclude fiscal year 20 and fiscal year 21 from that calculation um, the bill exempts from state income tax the um, and local income tax uh, corona coronavirus relief payments to the extent they are taxable and the um, last thing the bill does is it authorizes the Department of Commerce to turn they have a grant program it's the um, the Equity Participation Investment Program. It authorizes the Department of Commerce for fiscal year 21 and 22 to, to change those um, those loans to grants so the recipients wouldn't have to pay them back. So are there any questions about the, the components that they were brought forth by the governor? Sarah Alperth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Matt. I'm sorry. Can you just clarify the for unemployment uh, insurance taxation? This, is it tax year 20 or tax year 19? For the the unemployment the taxation of unemployment insurance benefits, mm -hmm. the provision would start for tax year 2020. So the the tax year that you'd be filing for in February. I think the filing season opens in a couple weeks in February. So you, you'd file for 2020, which would be this, this past tax year. Okay, thank and you so for it the changes it for that. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And going forward, changes it for that tax year and then in perpetuity. Okay, any other questions on that? Um, okay, actually, before we, were you planning to go sort of point by point through it? The, the uh, uh, recovery now? I, I was going to give the, the structure of, of how it works, and then we can get into any of the uh, individual uh, programs that you want. Okay. Um, actually, uh, can we put up on the screen, because I think it may be helpful to know, first off, where the money's coming from. Um, do we have that chart, Mr. Romans, or whoever can put that up on the screen, maybe? Yeah, share the screen now. Hold on. You seeing it? We do. Okay, so um, just so everyone is generally familiar, we have uh, a program that's, uh, five, I can barely see it, but is there a way to blow it up a little bit? I can make it bigger. Hold on. I think I'm okay. Ten years ago, I wouldn't have said that. I, that I, I got contacts in. These are my readers. I get all kinds of stuff going on to try to make it happen. But. Is that what, is this the best we can get? I think so. Okay. All right, well, let's move forward. Um, so 
This is a um, essentially a five hundred and twenty million dollar plan, and um, you can see that what we're effectively doing is taking money out of twenty one for rainy day. Remember, this whole plan is geared towards making um, these expenditures, these programmatic uh, moves, in order to help people as soon as possible. And that's why we're trying to get it done in 21. And the way to do that, uh, at least the, one, the way we've come up with, is to take the money out of the rainy day fund, which will bring it down, as you can see, to 3%. And that... Um, and then we turn around by 22 and put that money back in again at 320 million, which is the bulk of where we get the funds for this. And so the rainy day fund will be back at its 5% level, which is where, you know, we've traditionally held it for the uh, security of the economic security of the state and, and deal with difficult situations. I think this is a perfect example of how to use the rainy day fund because we're using it actually in a cash flow basis to do good things now when we need to do them. And then we already have a plan for refurbishing it literally within, um, within sort of the same, almost same time frame. We, uh, as you can see, we replenish it back, that $320 million, with, the, with $170 million that... Um, comes from the extension from the Biden administration that they've already done. This is sort of outside of stimulus. This is something that the Biden administration is capable of doing, so we're not waiting for something to pass through Congress. Um, this they've extended. Oh, look at that. Hallelujah. Oh, Somebody okay. figured it out. Um, yes? But I can't see it at all. <laughs> Oh, just because of where you're sitting? Right. Oh, okay. Sorry. I've, um, asked, I've asked them to email it to me, and I can send it to everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the email, so the email should go to the committee right now. Thank you. Thank Apologize you. for that. Yeah, we're learning along the way, everybody. We can all be, uh, as I've told staff, we need to be nimble. Nimble. Nimble is our word <laughs> for the year. Um, is that going out? I haven't gotten it yet. Oh. Somebody there has to send it. Oh, let me see. I don't have it. Somebody, you have to send it. It's been sent to Kim. And Kim is learning how to nimbly oh move gosh. around the plexiglass. I'm really being nimble over here. Mm. Okay, everybody, everybody got the, the, the uh, through email now. Okay, so the bottom line again, we're taking 320 out of the rainy day. We're able to, and it drops down to 3%. We're immediately turning it back in um, for the 22 budget so that it will be at the 5% that we um, uh, generally think is appropriate uh, for maintenance. And um, we're refurbishing that by... Uh, two steps. One, the Biden administration, outside of stimulus, was able to extend the enhanced Medicaid match, which we have been taking advantage of all year, but now it's extended uh, to December. Um, that's a portion of the match. Um, 
somewhere around half of the match, um, the additional money. It's, it's pretty flexible money. There'll be discussion about the Medicaid match as we go into committee, particularly in the health subcommittee, and the usefulness of that. It's about an additional 6% more that we don't have to come up with every year for the Medicaid budget. Um, and so that's um, uh, how we get to that. And then the second one is, is sort of an old um, sort of standard use uh, budgetary. As you know, we tried to um, put more money in than actuarially is required every year um, for the retirement system, referred to the supplemental payment, $75 million each year. Um, we don't always do that. Um, the fact of the matter is that we're in reasonably good shape with the pensions. Not putting that money in doesn't change anybody's pension, doesn't change uh, uh, when they get it, how they get it, anything along those lines. It simply uh, adds to the base as we sort of march towards 100 percent of funding, but uh, doesn't affect um, anything on the ground, uh, if you will. So it says two, two measures that allow us to recoup um, the rainy day fund at the 5 percent level. In terms of, uh, again, the other things up top to include, um, to get to that 520, uh, we also uh, have the local income tax reserve fund, and um, this is also a, sort of a standard tool that we have uh, used over the years when necessary. And um, that fund is, is a cash flow fund, and usually we're in a position, as we believe we are right now, to take uh, some money out of that, um, and I think actually there's going to be an amendment on that just to clarify that um, by Senator Griffith later on uh, as we move forward. Uh, and then the other $100 million is from the Blueprint Fund. Now what is important about this $100 million is that it is going directly into the recovery activities. It won't be going into the fund that we're creating in this bill, but is going to go directly into what has been identified on the sheets that you have seen as two fifty million dollar uh, components to uh, help with summer school and help with um, uh, getting getting kids back to school. Those kinds of issues. So uh, it is completely an educational issue. I also want to point out that as we all have heard the blueprint fund uh, uh, is funded, Kerwin is funded all the way through up to 2026. Uh, this use of this money doesn't change that. We will still be funded to that point. It does add on to 26 um, an issue in 26, but of course we have some time, plenty of time to make up on that uh, as we move forward. The only other thing on this chart you'll see is a deficiency uh, appropriations already uh, in the budget. All we're saying, is, and it's for COVID purposes, we just uh, want to ensure that um, a portion of that money is, uh, continues to be used for uh, our, our workers, our essential workers who are receiving a little extra in their paychecks for the work that they have done all throughout this pandemic. So that's... That's all the components. That last one doesn't actually factor into the fund, if you will, but um, nonetheless, uh, uh, we think it's important to ensure, uh, ensure we show them how much we appreciate their efforts throughout this. Okay, any questions about any of this? Yes, Senator Edwards. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Two questions. <clears throat> Uh, I know one year we tapped into the local income tax reserve fund and caught a little bit of flack, I think, from the locals on that. What, how much is left in that if we take $100 million out of there? David, do you have a number on that? Senator, the, the balance at the end of December was $1.5 billion. $1.5 billion? Yep. So if we take $100 million, that's $1.4 billion. Right. Second question. Uh, and this is, a, I guess, a psychological question that's going to come up when you mention the retirement supplemental payments and you got all these people in the retirement system are getting close to it and are anxious because they think the state's going to take their retirement from them. 
for a better way of explaining this to those people, because I can almost assure you're going to get a lot of questions you're, you know, you're taking from the retirement. We need to, to, to respond to that. So this just slows down, if I'm reading it right, because we agreed to put supplemental payments in to get up to the number that's needed quicker to balance it out so you get to zero, if that's a better way to say it. What specifically nothing does, is just does so just to, to be due to that? Yeah, just to be clear, nothing is being taken away. I understand that. We just, I'm just, I just, just for our talking about this issue, nothing is being taken away. We are merely not, uh, um, uh, not adding to at a higher rate than is necessary to be actuarially sound. I understand that. I, I'm just thinking out loud uh -huh. here sure. because every time we talk about retirement, we get hit from people who are in retirement system. We're getting close. You're robbing our system. We're going to take our retirement. I understand what you're saying, but maybe we're not asking this right. We need maybe a little better way to explain this. People, okay, it's not going to impact it at all. I can say that. Yep. But it, it, it slows down, though, initially getting to the point you're at zero. Yeah, so, so I mean, I mean this, is that? Yeah, I don't know if I'm getting my point across here. Yeah, you Maybe are. A better way you to are. It's a, it. it's a complicated problem, right? Because it is. The, the 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 reality is that when we were asked to create this fund several years back to ensure that the retirees get their money, inherently in this, and from my perspective, is the idea that somehow. Um, the state wouldn't be able to make the payments. So you want to put enough money in the fund that if the state was completely incapable of making any payments, in other words, the state was bankrupt, that they would still get their payments. The reality is, even at, um, and I don't know where we are, are we about 70%? Someone We're at 72.9, 73% 70, right now. Okay. So several years ago, we were down in the 60s, I believe. And um, now we're up to 72 percent, and um, you know, different people have different goals about what that should be. Should it be 80 percent? Should it be 100 percent? The reality is, you'd need it. The, the only reason it would need to be at 100 percent is if we went bankrupt and we stayed bankrupt, and and uh, people would need to get paid for many years. Um, we're not even close to that. So we, we, we believe in the concept of getting up to the point where we can cover that should the, a catastrophe happen. But um, uh, we're, we're not even not, not close to that in any sense. And I know that's, a compli that's probably too much to say, and, but... Um, no, Senator Eckert, I think, had a question. Senator Eckert. Okay. I was going to let Senator Edwards finish okay. up if he wanted to. I understand that. I mean, I'm just saying in past experience, we're going to get a lot of phone calls when people see that one. The easiest answer is we're up to 73%. We want to get to 100. This doesn't impact it whatsoever. It just slows us down from getting to the 100%. But there's plenty in there for you. I mean, I've explained this to people all the time, but just some of the new members here, I can guarantee you'll probably get questions about this one. Uh, you know, you're taking from our, 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 our retirement the answer. You're correct, and the, the main point is a 73% fool at this point. Right. Senator Eckert, and then... I would just add a point of clarification. Would it be easier? I know it's framed as supplemental, um, but really in one way we're overpaying what the expectation is. So, you know, if you just say we're taking a pause on the additional payment to that fund, maybe that softens it a little bit for my colleague in Western Maryland and for all of us who are going to get those phone calls. Thank you. Our chair of our pension subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, Senator Edwards, thank you. I, I'm hearing you and, and Philip, uh, if he has time today, I hope he does, and I will work on getting talking points to this committee, exactly your questions, so we're prepared for the floor tomorrow and you're prepared to answer any constituent concerns that we hear. We'll get those to you by the morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Stalling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, you know, I think we answered some of the questions. Uh, my biggest concern is is that the use of the rainy day fund, and how you know, we're making sure that we can answer every question, that we're using that the right way. 
because I know there's a lot of people who are saying, well, we used the transportation fund at one time. We didn't use it for the right way. Um, we're doing this. So I just want to make sure those questions that they come to me, you know, saying, okay, you know, is, was this the reason why we have the rainy day fund? And yeah. I, you know, yes, sir. And that's the only reason why I think, and my concern, and voting for this, yes, makes all the sense in the world. And yeah. I will be, but it's just one of my questions. So thank you. Yeah, I think it's it's a good good question, and I think as I as I was uh, uh, said in part earlier, I think this may be the absolute best time um, to use the rainy day fund and also have an immediate plan for re, uh, replenishing it. Um, and it, it uh, I think it's it's actually a perfect use for it as a cash flow to ensure that we get money into the hands of the people who need it right now. Uh, in the state so yep any other questions about this chart okay so now we're gonna uh, Matt is going to go through the details of the fund okay um, well, we'll start off with with what you just described the money um, on the amendment section 6 this is authorizing the governor to make two transfers, one of $320 million from the Rainy Day Fund, another $100 million from the local reserve account into the um, fund that's being created. It's, it's called the Recovery Now Fund. Uh, it's from that fund that the, the payments are all going to be made. The, in case you're wondering, the $100 million that was identified uh, as coming from Blueprint, that's not going into the fund. That's going to be spent in Section 8. Uh, the authorized transfers are in Section 8, and those are two $50 million transfers to education purposes. Um, so that's why it's a little bit disjointed. Um, but Section 7 then creates the special fund, um, the Recovery Now Fund, and it then authorizes the governor to make, uh, make transfers out of the fund by budget amendment. Um, and then... Um, Paragraph 3 identifies which agencies all of these, um, all of these uh, funds are going to go through and so whose budget that they're going to go through. Um, and so there's a chart that goes from, what is this, page 2, 3, on to page 4, and that has each agency's budget that the, the, and the amount that's going to flow through it. And then following, um, there are uh, paragraphs um, that correspond to each one of these appropriations that then direct how to use that money. Um, I will note that the, the ones related to transportation, uh, there are no subparagraphs for because that's, that's sort of backfilling um, lost revenue, so there isn't any, any direction uh, with regard to, um, to those payments. So the, the, um, um, the only paragraphs identified are the ones where uh, the legislature is deci deciding to put um, uh, some restrictions on how the agencies are going to spend the money or where the money is going to go. Can I, can I ask a quick question about that? I know that there are two large, there's a transit component and a roads component, but then there's also, I think, $8 million for um, commuter. Sh commuter shuttle service. That one, I think, um, is that detailed in some way because that needs to go to the providers of that service, that that's a that's a business-related um, problem that was created when routes were diminished from 100 to 50 percent, and the fixed costs associated to the the companies that we hire to do that. Yes, that one is, is specified that the authorities to use the, uh, the money to assist commuter and shuttle buses with losses that are a result of the pandemic. Okay. Um, right, but, it, but it's, it, it should be the private. Maybe we need to have okay. that word in we there. we can add a word. Yeah, because it's for the private services that we contract with. Oh. Senator Edwards, did you have a question? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I don't know if this is appropriate time, but, but as Matt goes through this, 
and I'll just pick on the one you mentioned, the roads, and, and there's one in our community colleges. That, and, and if I heard you right, the, these monies on the right-hand column are going to go to the departments. That they should go to and expense it out. But the question is, and maybe you're going to do this as you go through it, on what basis are they going to distribute it? In other words, we do have a formula for road money going back. Are they going to use that formula for this additional money and community colleges? Yeah, we're going, to go through, we're going to go through each one of them. I, I thought I was kind of going to get to to explain that. Yeah, and it's a little different um, for different ones. Okay. Let me just, before he goes forward, I just want to explain, explain sort of conceptually how these um, numbers were come up with, had, had come up with. So um, the fact of the matter is that the federal government, through the CARES Act, um, through a second stimulus act that the sort of skinny version that was recently passed but is not reflected in our budget yet, as was described, um, I think, before, or may have been described before, as well as um, the governor's activities, um, to take money out of the rainy day fund and, and, and use it in a number of categories. What the challenge of coming up with this plan uh, was what has been done and where are the gaps. And so you'll see things along here where there are programs that were created by the governor already, um, and we're not... Uh, this isn't a criticism at all of what has been done. This is a, um, we're seeing ourselves move through time and realizing that we have some additional funds and we think that um, we need to add to those funds to uh, have that program uh, more fully assist the people that it needs to, to assist. So the challenge of this was looking at all the different pots of money that have already been spent on stimulus and recovery and trying to figure out where we can add to make the most difference in people's lives. And that's what we've tried to do here, which means that, as I think to the Senator's question was, um, there are places where the department itself makes sense um, to, to, to give the money out based on some criteria they've already developed. In some cases, they're brand new. And we're saying maybe that they need to go directly to uh, the local governments to distribute. Um, in some cases, um, they're just different kinds of formulas, and we'll, we'll go through all of that, because um, I want everybody to understand all that's included in this package uh, as we move forward. Uh, but I hope that helps answer sort of how we got to where we are. In some cases, you might notice, you might say, well, I've heard a lot about X. I need, why aren't we spending more on X? And the answer is, in some cases, We've, we've looked at what has already happened and what is programmed to happen through, federal, through the federal government. Of course, the Biden administration um, uh, has an additional stimulus package, and we're trying to program this all together in a very complicated way to make as most sense possible, um, again, to help the most people. So um, you can continue. I'm sorry for that little interlude, but I hope that it helps frame uh, how this all came to pass. All right. So the, the first authorization is for the uh, Temporary Disability Assistance Program, and you'll find that under paragraph four. Um, the, the idea here is, is to uh, make some tweaks to the, the programs in statute. So, so there's some language here that um, would allow a recipient of payments. Um, it allows individuals to be put back in the program if they were removed from the program during this past fiscal year, um, as long as the result of removal from the program wasn't a determination related to their supplemental security income. Um, so, and, these, and so these are people who have uh, uh, low income and are disabled. The temporary program, um, it's, um, uh, we found during the pandemic one of the requirements of the program is that you have to sort of re-up and tell uh, the program uh, that uh, you need, uh, you, you're still uh, in a disabled uh, status. And so you have to go to a doctor to get that approval. And of course, everybody for months haven't been able to go uh, to doctors or, or it's been more difficult. 
So there was a huge drop. Half of the pro half of the program percipient precipitants yeah. um, uh, dropped out of the program. And so we're saying we need to make sure that those people um, get back into the program. Plus, we may recall that the governor in, Creed, in the temporary cash assistance program added six months of additional payments of $100 a month. In that program, we're doing the same thing in this program. So it's sort of twofold. It covers out. All right. So the next one we're moving on to is um, money that's going to run through the Maryland Emergency Management Agency, um, and the agency is being directed to distribute this money to volunteer fire departments. Right, and this we've had reports that the volunteer fire companies have had helped those move forward in the future. The next one's going through the Office of Grants Management. Um, that office is then going to distribute the, the amount authorized to local governments who are going to be instructed to provide grants to food banks, food banks throughout the state. And again, we, we know the situation that we've been seeing across the state with food banks. Yes, <laughs> Senator Peters. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, I was a little <clears throat> slow on the speaker. Um, we'll, we go back to the... Uh, volunteer fire grant yes sir there was an email I received that there's a difference between volunteer fire and volunteer rescue squads so mm -hmm. there was a request to put that language in okay what do we know what the difference is I can I can get that for you yeah okay well it uh, let's let's together yeah, yeah verify that and put it together yeah. yep no. okay thank you mr. chairman sure and I that I appreciate Senator Peters raising the issue, um, but the intent is both. Yes. And we want to clarify that. Yep. Okay. All right. Okay. I got another question whenever you're ready. Yeah, sure. Uh, is it we, germane we, to the lineup that we're going through, or is uh, it? Yeah, it relates to the Office of Grants Management. Okay. Very good. What is it? I never heard of it. I will defer to David on that one. Um, David. Yeah, well, there's a question about the Office of Grants Management and um, what it does or... Uh, so this is, this is um, just how, where they budget the money that goes out to the food banks as a grant. Um, so the money is, the $10 million is just being dropped into the Office of Grants Management to handle giving out the grants to food banks across the state. Yeah, I don't think the Senator is aware of... What is the Office of Grants Management? What agency is it in? Oh, this is the Department of Human Services. Got it. That answers my question. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Eckert. Thank you very much. Have, um, and I'm a little slow on where a medical adult day, did you cover that in the first category? Or is medical adult day centers included in any of this? Medical think, adult daycare? Yes. No, we haven't, we haven't touched that, and I'm not sure exactly where that might fall. Okay, uh, I'm just, I know they were almost, dying before and a lot of them have adapted into providing home services but I don't think they've qualified for any backfill. Um, to this we point. have a health care section okay. once we get there why don't we bring that up and maybe Mr. Romans can comment okay. on what resources may already exist for them. That's perfect thank you. Great. You can continue. Senator Young. So the, Senator Young. Oh I'm sorry Senator Young. Um, my question on this probably is going to apply to a lot of them, but uh, the money's going to the food banks. How, uh, is the Office of Grants Management just going to decide who gets it and send it, or are they going to establish a program and notify various food banks the money's available? I'm wondering on a lot of these, how, how are the possible uh, potential recipients going to even know? Well, th this is one of the programs where the, the state agency is just acting as a flow through, and they're going to make a determination as to which local governments are going to get the, the money, and then the local governments are actually going to be the ones who are going to provide the grants to the food banks. So the grants uh, management office will decide that X amount of dollars is going to Baltimore City and X amount of dollars is going to Allegheny County, and then... Uh, They'll so, decide from there what to do with it? Yeah. So, I mean, it's a really good question, actually, and a complicated one, of course, um, because it, it seems, first off, let me, let me make something uh, clear again, I think, that all this money 
needs to be out the door by the end of the fiscal year. So this is a this is a quick hit um, of of dollars, and so utilizing existing structure is helpful. We know that we don't have perfect information at all about um, how that has been uh, handled throughout the year because uh, you know they've been working to get other programs out the door. So, but it's a good question and one that probably. I don't know, maybe we can add some sort of global language on this about distributed uh, as equally across the state as, as, as uh, possible. But again, we may also note that those agencies that are making those determinations, may, there may be a more critical need in one place as opposed to another place. So um, really, we are in part giving them um, a, a fair amount of leeway, but in the same token, I think it may be reasonable to do something um, sort of as practicable or something along those lines um, for the whole, for, for everything that we do. Does that, is that kind of where you're getting at, Senator? Well, I just know, for example, there was an arts grants program. And one of the arts groups in Frederick County, they had the chance to apply under arts or tourism. They do a lot of tourism, so they applied under tourism. They got turned down and said they should have been under the arts, yeah. so they didn't get anything. Yeah. And I just want to know at some point what the process is so I could tell a food bank, an arts group, any group, here's where you go and here's what you have to do. Or is somebody here going to do that? Right. By here, I mean the agency it goes yeah, to. Yeah, no, I, I get you. Um, Senator Rosenpeb. Yeah, I, I agree with Senator Young that that's a generic problem with this. And, but I think, and I don't know a lot of these programs, but I think most of these programs, many of them, I won't say most, actually have existing formulas of some kind. And I think we're going to learn about them like tomorrow, once this is all public, <laughs> right. is everybody's going to come out of the woodwork and say, well, the way this is normally done is. And so... I agree with you, Mr. Chairman, about maybe some generic language, but I also think this is going to go through the process that we're going to learn actually some simpler ways of getting this out faster with existing formulas. And I think we just ought to be open when we hear that from people to be open to making those kind of changes. Because to get it out fast, the less discretion, the better in a way. Because people, having people apply for grants slows everything down. So I would just throw that general thought out there. Right. Um, Senator McCray. What's that? McCray. Oh, Senator McCray. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just have a question, and I guess this is more for the analysts in reference to uh, the bills introduced affected our local governments. Um, look like about 180 million. Could you just talk to you with the amendments how that impact now is going to be with the local governments? I'm not sure we actually heard everything you just said. So, 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 so you're uh, talking about the, the the governor's plan on and the effect yeah, on yeah. on tax yep. tax base. Yep, yep exactly. Like it, it had a okay. Okay, let's. Uh, let, okay, um, all right. We'll at the appropriate time. Right. We'll we'll do that towards the end. We've already sort of gone through that part. Um, so uh, we'll 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 circle back on that when we get to the end. Let's continue and go through all these programs, and then we'll circle back. Somebody remind us. All right. We left off with paragraph seven, um, and these Madam are. Madam Senator David, can I can I just make one comment on the food banks and the way it's drafted? It, it kind of goes with your discussion, um, which is the, the way it's drafted. It would go to the local governments, or it sounds like it would go out to each county. The way the Department of Human Services usually gives out the food bank money is it goes to the Maryland Food Bank and the Capital Area Food Bank, and then those two organizations take care of distributing it. So, you, I mean, if, you certainly could put it through the counties, but that is not the way it normally gets done. So you may want to send it to those two groups instead of, um, you know, creating new processes for all the counties to work through. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Senator Griffin? Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, because I've, I've done a lot of work with the Capital Area Food Bank and the Maryland Food Bank, and I do know that they have a vast network of the local food pantries in each jurisdiction and are quite familiar with distributing 
both perishable and non-perishable uh, through their networks. So it makes sense to me that the language be consistent with that practice of working through the Maryland Food Bank and the Capital Area Food Bank. Senator Roosevelt? Yeah, I mean, I just agree with that in, in the sense of to get it out fast, get it to the normal, through the normal process. Okay. We'll make that change. Now, note, when, I, when I'm saying we're going to make that change, I know we're, we're kind of doing this on the fly. The, the goal, of course, is to get this done by next week, so we're not going to have a written amendment changes before you. So, but when you hear me say that, know that that will be changed, that we've agreed in theory that that's going to be included in the amendment and that ultimately, at the end of the day, when you vote, you will be voting for uh, the amendment with all of that in it. All right. Now moving to paragraph seven, um, this has to do with energy assistance. The program would be run through the Office of Home Energy Programs, and the office would distribute uh, grants to assist households that have utility arages. Self-explanatory. Next. The next one uh, goes to the Maryland Community Health Resource Commission. And the commission is going to be required to provide grants to community providers of services under Title VII of the Health General Article uh, to support pandemic-related reopening, transformation, and revenue loss. So um, you might be wondering why it goes to that office instead of the uh, Department of uh, um, Developmentally Disabled Administration. Um, and the reason is that they've had... Um, targeted grants already go out through um, that office and so that's why we chose that mechanism. The regular money that goes through like the 4% that everybody knows about and hears about and the fact that the governor actually accelerated that, all of that, that good stuff still goes through the department. This is just a very specified grant, one-time grant uh, and that's why it's going through that agency. Senator Roosevelt? Yeah, I think there's several other health-related provisions here. Yeah, yes. I think it would be helpful just to sort of talk about them a little bit together to understand how this is different from the other one is different from the other one. Um, okay. Which are the others I'm looking for? All right. <laughs> there's a whole health section. Well, maybe we just take the, why don't we come back and mention this when we come back to the whole health sure. section. So sure. We'll look at them together. Let's, Thank you. Yeah, let's keep going in order for now. Yeah, yeah. All right. We are now moving to nonprofits. Um, this next one would be would be for the Neighborhood Revitalization Program, which is handled by the Department of Housing and Community Development. They would then distribu distribute the money to local governments to provide grants to nonprofits that can demonstrate um, need with priority given to organizations that have not received assistance through the Neighborhood Revitalization Program in the past. There was a suggestion to require that the grants be at least five thousand dollars. Do you want to um, do you want to put that string on the on the um, on the money, or do you want the local governments to determine the size of the grants to to give? Senator, I vote for flexibility. I say no minimum. Okay, we'll be silent then. All right, moving to uh, paragraph 10. This money would go to the Maryland State Arts Council. The council would provide emergency art grants to artists, art districts, and art organizations. Um, the council is going to be required to prioritize grants to organizations that have not received prior funding from the council or do not qualify for funding un under other council programs. Moving to paragraph 11, um, this money would be going through the Maryland Economic Development Assistance Authority and Fund. Um, the authority would, would be required to provi provide $12,000 grants to businesses that do not engage in a business activity that requires the business to collect sales and use tax, demonstrates a need for the assistance, and has not received a prior grant uh, from the authority or the fund. Uh, there is a requirement that the authority distribute at least 15% of the 
at least 15% of the amount being distributed is going to be required to go to small minority and women-owned businesses. So um, you might be wondering why is the $12,000, and the reason is $12,000. As you can see, what we're trying to get at in the governor's um, language created that program that um, you could get up to $12,000 if you, um, in sort of um, in sales tax, that you did not have to remit to uh, the comptroller. And so we just mirrored that in an attempt to pick up businesses that don't actually pay sales taxes or service-oriented businesses. None of this is perfect, quite frankly, and we, I mean, I know that, I mean, and you should all know that too, that it's not, nothing matches exactly right, but I think it's our best attempt to try to, again, fill in some gaps. Senator Elfrid. I'm sorry, did you call? Senator? Oh, Alfred? Alfred, Alfred. yes. I'm oh, sorry. I'll <laughs> Thanks, Kim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Matt, just a question on all of these line items that, that have the kind of contingent have not received assistance in the past. How are we measuring that? Is that state assistance, county assistance, federal assistance? I just want to be able to communicate this to those in my community. How are we, are we putting that detail in here? It, it gen, if, it's, if the money's flowing through a program or a fund, like here we're dealing with the Maryland Economic Development Assistance Authority and Fund, it's referencing back to that okay. that fund or that authority. Okay. So um, depending on how narrow the the program is, um, it it could be different for each each one. Like here, it's just referencing whether they've received any grant in the past from that uh, from that authority. From that authority. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sarah Rosebud. Yeah, thank you. This is more for communications purposes. Who do we think are likely to be the big beneficiaries? The context is people who don't collect sales tax, but sort of what. What would be the big examples that we should cite to our constituents, the kind of folks who are getting help here who right. aren't getting help from the rest of them? Yeah, we'll have to get the NICS codes out, but, I mean, it's sort of the classic one is to say uh, barber shop, if you will. Yeah. Services. Sure. The, the state generally does not tax services, and services would be the, um, the, the primary uh, people who have uh, who wouldn't have a sales and use tax account with the comptroller's office. I think it would be helpful for floor purposes to give examples or something that we can handle. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Senator Peters. Oh. Tough to see back there, Senator. I'm yeah. in the corner here. Sorry. So company gets a PPP, they're still eligible for this? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I agree. I think we definitely need something on the floor because these questions will come popping up. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. So moving to paragraph 12. This one's running through the same fund. It's the, the Maryland Economic Development Assistance Authority Fund. Um, and this would be for $12,000 grants to um, uh, businesses that are primarily engaged in activities um, within a certain NICS code. And the NICS code referenced is 7225, which is restaurants. Um, and so these would be $12,000 grants to, to restaurants. Um, the same other two contingencies, they, they have to demonstrate a need for assistance and have to have not received, have, have not received a grant from the authority in the past. Um, and then there's the same requirement that 15% of the, the amount distributed needs to go to small minority and women-owned businesses. Let me, um, let me raise this idea on this one in particular, um, this idea of not having received assistance in the past. This might be one where we might want to be a little more um, open to allowing them to receive more money just because of the nature and the devastation to that industry. Um, I might suggest and open to hear thoughts or comments about what you think that we would just, uh, I mean, I think the, the goal should be to get it to people who have not received anything. But my guess is that most have received something. Um, but I don't know that for sure. We don't have the data on all of this. That's the problem. Um, so, but my, my, are we, is, is everybody generally in agreement with what I'm saying? Yes? Yes. Yeah. Senator Salings, you have a comment? I mean, as, as you know, some of the restaurants and areas that where I'm at, um, Yes, some of them got some relief. Some of them didn't get anything, as probably in every area throughout the state. 
there's some restaurants that will never come back, and some restaurants are just barely making it right now, and they don't even know if they're going to make it next week. I think can there be possibly a category where there's somebody that not, not get any relief whatsoever, and maybe we, they can highlight that in some way so we can help them out even more so? That's a su suggestion. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think maybe the idea of sort of um, that they would be the first Prioritize businesses that have not received a grant from the authority. Yeah, okay. yeah. Senator uh, Griffith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That was consistent with my um, my thinking. As a matter of fact, we were kind of having the same conversation about the arts organizations that you might go through a first round of people that haven't received any funding before, or that that would be a strategy to prioritize and then to open it up. Because what we don't want is money left on the table at the end because not enough new people reach out. So Agreed. I think my comments are consistent with yours on that. Great. The, the Arts Council does have the prioritized language in. Um, so it, yeah, yeah, okay. And did we want to make this the same change for the, um, the other money that was going to um, um, businesses that don't have a, don't remit sales and use tax? Yeah, we, we probably do want it to get out. The, it's got to get out the door. Kind okay. Of question. We just don't have a lot, lot of time on this. I will Senator use prioritize there. there. Oh, Zuckerberg. he just. Oh, just no. Not, okay. Okay. Hotels and hospitality. All right. Moving on to par that's paragraph thirteen. Um, this money would also go through the the same fund, um, and this money would be given to local governments to provide $25,000 grants to businesses that are primarily engaged in, in a NICS code. The NICS code that I referenced was 721110, and that just corresponded to uh, hotels and hospitality industry when you go to the, the NICS codes. Um, this one has that same restriction, have not received a, a prior grant from the authority, so I'll change that to be prioritize yep. Um, businesses. Yep. Senator Rosebeth? Yeah, I got a question on size on this one, because uh, hotels are a little different industry. Yep. So how does this work in terms of, you know, facilities owned, you know, jointly owned, I own six hotels, or I've got a big hotel, or I own a small hotel? Is this like all hotels, regardless of size, ownership, et cetera? Um, yes. All right. There isn't, there, isn't any, there isn't any restriction with regard to size. Um, I would note that the, the NICS code had a separate code for bed and breakfasts, so they, they would fall, they, they categorize their hotels differently. Um, so bed and breakfast would not benefit from They had a separate NICS code for bed and breakfast, and there was also a separate NICS code for hotels attached to casinos. Okay, well, I mean, given it's only $25,000, I'm not really worried about the big guys getting at the expense of little guys. So, I mean, I think it's okay, but I want to clarify it. But Ben Breakfast, I haven't even thought about it. Where would Ben Breakfast fit into this whole scheme, if anywhere? Um, so there, you didn't use that NICS code, is what you're saying? I didn't use that NICS code. They would be eligible, I think, for the, the small business grant. Um, no, I, I'm not sure where they would fit in. I think they should fit in someplace. I don't know where. Thoughts? Anybody else have any thoughts on that? Opposition to that. Okay, let's include that next code. Okay. Thank you. All right, moving on to paragraph 14. Um, this money would flow through the Neighborhood Revitalization Program, which is within the Department of Housing and Community Development, and it would be used to provide 10 grants to the 12 largest entertainment venues in the state. Yeah, so um, this is um, so there, this is one of those ones where we're trying to thread a needle again. Um, the governor already had a $30 million program, and um, from what I understand, and again, this is not perfect information, that um, the, the, the smaller entities got the money that roughly, and again, I don't want to, I'm going to get a call from 100 
of the small entity, smaller entities, that, that they got a higher proportion of, of solving their problem than some of the larger venues, ones that we invest a lot in and have invested a lot in that are that have huge uh, fixed cost budgets. So it's really a proportional thing. Again, not perfect information. And I think we ha did we have a list of what, what are considered sort of the 12, do we know? No, we can we can work on getting that, that list Yeah, together. I mean, I think there's some um, information out there about the size of some of these entities, um, you know, hippodromes of the world kind of thing, um, that just have so high fixed costs that they may have gotten, um, you know, uh, what might have amounted to in that program like a month's worth of, of carrying cost. Um, the Hagerstown one I know, um, Merriweather in, 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 in Howard County, um, Smor uh, what, Strathmore in Montgomery, um, those are some of the names that, that have these big carrying costs. So we'll try to tighten that up before uh, we go to the floor, though. Questions on that, Senator Alfred? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Matt, uh, are we putting any strings on, on these grants to ensure that, impl that these companies or nonprofits are keeping their employees employed and paid? What, are you talking about generally, or are you talking about the, the entertainment venues? Generally. We are not. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I think the, um, it, it just, it adds, again, it's one of those ones that could add a level of, of complication in getting this out the door. Yeah. I, I understand. We want to get it out. I just also have heard from businesses, some of the ones that were not successful with the first round of CARES money, that larger corporations and companies received it and, and did not keep employees paid the way that I think everybody intended. Um, just want to, we want to get this out the door fast. I just want to flag that for folks. Yeah, Thank you. Senator Roosevelt. Yeah, if I can add on to that, because I know that issue very, very well, uh, and, and I'm a big champion of supporting the workers, as, as everyone is here. But this, several of these actually are not focused on the workers. I mean, the unemployment compensation stuff is focused on the workers. They're the jobs things we're going to talk about later. They're focused on the workers. This is the carrying cost issue. This is a lot of these very capital-intensive places. Um, it's not, they can't have the workers come in because they can't open up. And I literally had a restaurant with that issue with the PPP who couldn't bring his, work, his, his uh, servers in, but he wanted to get the PPP and he wanted to obey the law, so he ended up hiring people to do repair work on the building, <laughs> which were not the workers that it was intended for. It was, so it was screwed up. But I'm just saying this is more on people so they don't lose their property, so they don't go default on their loans, so the business is still there when the, when the economy gets better. Thank you. Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just for clarification, can you give two examples of what the t you said 10 grants to the 12 largest <laughs> entertainment? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, yeah, I don't think you heard me. Uh, so Hippodrome's one, like uh, Strathmore's one, okay. um, Merriweather. Uh, there's uh, uh, an entity in Hagerstown that I know Got is it. larger. I, yep, yep. I appreciate you. This, if I can follow up on Senator Alfred's uh, point, and I understand uh, Senator Rosa Pep's uh, point too, but is there some form of a minimum threshold of an expectation of amount of workers? I get you're not going to keep half your workforce or three quarters of your workforce. But is there some threshold that a minimum expectation of these organizations? I don't know. If we start trying to define that, I don't know. I think it's it's tricky. Um, it really is. Okay. Um, again, this is just through June. Got it. Okay. Moving to paragraph 15, um, this would be $10 million that would flow into the Maryland Small Minority and Women-Owned Business Account um, under the Economic Development Article, and it would get distributed to the fund managers under, under, the, um, uh, under that program. It's my understanding there's two different programs. One program has only one fund manager. 
Um, the budget analyst did advise me that that this is the program that has eight fund managers, so it would flow through the formula within that that um, that statute and be distributed to the fund all all eight fund managers. Um, it's the one that was set up for through the VLT. That's why we wanted to have a broader base across the state. So the next program is in relation to job training. Um, this money would flow through the workforce development program within the Department of Labor, and the Department of Labor would provide job placement assistance uh, through local workforce development boards. I, I knew Senator Rose, I could see his, his <laughs> finger itching immediately when we're talking about workforce development. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, I'm, and I'm, great. I'm so glad this is in here. I think it's terrific. This is an example of where there are existing formulas that could be used. I don't know if I'm off the top of my head, but I think we look at them. And I also would suggest that it be broadened beyond job placement assistance because there are different needs in different counties immediately. And some of the counties in, in the city have been doing these things over the past couple of months, and I'd like to have this flexible for them and then also come up with a formula. What? Anybody else have comments on sort of letting Matt figure this out with the senator? Senator, obviously, is, you know, he has a expertise in this issue. Yeah. Right, right. Okay. All right, that change will be made. And there was a requirement attached to that program. It, it was on the next page. But it requires the department to prioritize youth jobs and jobs related to reentry. Um, I think I mean, that, that's fine. I think we can work that out in, in, in the overall. In okay. okay. Great. Moving to paragraph 17, this would be money that would flow through um, TEDCO and Marbid. They would do this in consultation with Marbidco. Um, and they'd be required to provide grants to Maryland's rur rural and agricultural businesses. Okay. Mo moving to paragraph 18, um, this money would flow through the Neighborhood Revitalization Program within the Department of Hu Housing and Community Development, and they would develop a grant program to help preserve Main Street's uh, economies within the state. Actually, Mr. Chairman, I have a question about that one. Absolutely, Senator. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it sounds like that's incredibly flexible. And so basically uh, one of the Main Street operations could say, look, we need it for this, and a different one says we need it for something totally different. So it really is very, very flexible. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, this would be a, a very, very broad program and give the department um, a lot of flexibility. So just to give you an example, I mean, it could be related to not – um, not like businesses that have had tremendous downturns, but a, a, a good example is because of teleworking, what's going on with the office market is like dramatically changing. And a, a lot of businesses, that retailers, have, have had to dramatically change. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of sort of the Ellicott City, I'm thinking of the places like that. So this would be flexible to. There wouldn't be a demonstration of particular businesses or in particular ways, but it's more about the general community development survival and prosper. Is that a fair description? I there are, the no, there are no restrictions on it. So, okay. yep. right. Thank you very much. That's important. Thank you. This is a good, good, very good idea. All right. We're, we're moving back to the Maryland Economic Development Assistance Authority, um, and they will receive $3 million to uh, provide grants to businesses in distressed communities to assist the businesses in setting up an online sa online sales framework and also offering employees teleworking opportunities. So I, I read this to be tra helping these businesses transition to what is the new normal. Um, the next program is paragraph 20. Uh, this money would go to the Maryland Tourism Development Board, and the board would be required to use the amount provided to help market Maryland small businesses for tourism. Actually, Mr. Chairman, I apologize. Yeah, one more question back on the previous one. Yeah. Distressed communities, 
Is that a term of art, or is that something for the department to decide what a distressed community is? I, I am not aware if this is something that's related to the program. David, do you know anything um, about whether the, there's a program that involves distressed communities within the, uh, what would the, this would be the Maryland Economic Development Assistance Authority? I don't know the, I don't know the answer to that. Actually, there may be, there's that, that lineup of several counties that yes. fall in some of the tax credit bills. I don't know if that's what it may be referring to. Senator Eckert? There may be, and they may need those jurisdictions within the disparity counties. Yeah. I know we used the stress counties when we did the One Maryland program years ago, and I don't know whether that's still language in the law or not. We'd have to validate that. Yep. Senator yeah, I'm not suggesting we change anything right now, but I think we should figure out what it is and figure out if it's the right language we might want to deal with as we go forward. So noted. Okay. I think we're on paragraph 20 now. Um, this would be $40 million to the Office of Unemployment Insurance that's within the Maryland Department of Labor and they would provide $1,000 grants to uh, any individual who's had their unemployment insurance suspended uh, as long as the reason for the suspension was not related to an allegation of fraud. Right. So these are folks who have sort of been jammed up for a while and um, we're going to try to help them out. Um, okay. Okay. Moving on to paragraph 22, this would be $3 million also going to the Office of Unemployment Insurance. Um, and they would be required to use the money to hire additional caseworkers that would assist Maryland residents with accessing unemployment insurance benefits. Okay. Moving to paragraph 23, this would be a million dollars for the for the Department of Labor, also the, the Office of Unemployment Insurance, uh, requiring um, them to use the money to try and reach a program participation goal of 5%. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I thought this was a provision dealing with the work share program. It is. Okay. It doesn't well. say that. That's why I'm yep. uh, raising no, the question. That's, thank you. Okay. Good catch. And, and, I, and I would make a suggestion, which is 5% uh, uh, is a relatively low goal. Um, it's been reached by a whole bunch of other states, but a whole bunch of states have gone much higher than 5%. And I would suggest saying reaching a goal of at least 5% participation to indicate that we're looking at it as a minimum, not as a maximum. Sure. Thank okay. you. Can you do that change? And now we are moving on to, um, this was the, um, the, the, um, tra oh, so, so here's where, where you would see two of the transportation grants, but because they're backfilling lost revenue, there isn't any, there are no strings to attach to this. So there would be $30 million going to MTA and $25 million going to state highway. Um, because that's replacing lost revenue, there are, there are no subparagraphs to put strings or, or um, guardrails on. But then moving on to the, um, the shuttles and, and uh, commuter buses, here this would be $8 million that the, um, the Maryland Economic Development Assistance Authority would provide to private commuter and shuttle buses that have losses that are a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Moving on to paragraph number 25, this would be money for the um, community services program within the Department of Health, and the money would be used to provide mobile crisis and standalone walk-in standalone walk-in crisis services for the treatment of community health and substance use disorders. How much money is that? It's $20 million. That's $20 million. Yep. Yeah, we've got a lot of facilities out there that um, actually exist. Um, they certainly need the extra assistance 
given the demands on mental health services that have ex sort of exploded, unfortunately, through the pandemic. So we're moving on to paragraph 26. This would be $14 million that would go to the Maryland Community Health Resource Commission. The commission would use this money to provide uh, grants to reduce health disparities, improve health outcomes, um, improve access to primary care, promote primary and secondary prevention services, and reduce health care costs and hospital admissions and readmissions. So is, is that language taken directly from the bill? I believe, I, I didn't work on this provision, I believe Philip uh, pulled this from, there was a program at one point called the Health Enterprise Zone Program, and that program no longer exists, but I think Philip tracked down the, the intent, Philip's on, um, would you like to chime in, Philip? Yeah, so that language mirrors uh, language in the bill you heard yesterday, Senate Bill 172. Perfect. There was a Senator Hayes bill about the, um, uh, sorry, I'm Blanking on the, the it is different terminology than health enterprise zone, but it would establish a new um, program if enacted. But the enterprise zone program um, expired a few years back. Perfect. Is there right. actual words that say health equity in there? Health re reducing health disparities. Okay. Okay. Moving on to paragraph twenty-seven. Um, yeah. This relates really back to my health question earlier on. Yes. Yeah. So how do they relate to each other, and what's under one and what's under the other? What are you referring to? How well, they relate? We had a health provision earlier on. Yeah, the other one had to do with the, the DD community, developmentally disabled. That's limited. The one, the one above goes to the same agency, but it's limited to DD? That was, that was, a, that was a standalone. I thought, I thought we had a health one earlier. That was it. Maybe I misunderstood. You, you stopped us on that one. I know I did, but I, I apologize. I'll, I'll try to catch up here. I apologize. Is no, it, it's, it's number eight. Number eight? It goes to the Maryland Community Health Resource Commission. Ah, okay. That is, okay. So what I tried to explain then was that that is for the developmentally disabled. I see. And it didn't go to the department because there was already something set up with that agency right. to but, do but it, grants But it's limited for to developing the disabled. But that's the, the Correct. significance of that one. Correct. And, and the one down below that we just looked at is open to the everybody. Was limited to behavioral health. I see. Okay. Uh, but the one Both we're talking mental about. health and addictions services. And, oh, I'm sorry. And then the next one is health disparities. So... I'm sorry. So the mental health portion above, right, the, the, the um, um, crisis facilities, crisis walk-ins, all that stuff, that goes to the department and, it's function, and it will be distributed out to providers in the community. They're providers that already do this work. Yep, I got that. This health enterprise zone, we are, we are putting in that same agency with the DD because we believe that they are, this is a new program. Um, we heard this bill yesterday. Yeah, yeah. And we believe that they're uniquely qualified. Yeah, yeah. I get that. To manage it. Okay? okay, thank you. Sure. Senator Eckert. To point um, before the pilot programs for the health enterprise zones went through that agency before. So they know it very well and know how to make it happen quickly. Thank Excellent. Thank you for that history. Moving on to paragraph 27, uh, this money would go through the Office of Preparedness and Response. That office would use, um, it would be about $10 million, it would be $10 million uh, for vaccine-related grants, and this one would also throw through, flow through the county governments. This would, this would require a grant to each county government to provide vaccine outreach and training and then there's also a, um, a requirement that of that $10 million, at least $1.5 million is going to be provided to the University of Mar Maryland, Baltimore, um, for assistance with a mobile vaccine administration program that they've been operating. Moving on to paragraph 28, um, this would be um, money related to public health jobs. 
Um, here, the money would also go through the Office of Preparedness and Response, and the office would provide outreach, recruitment, and training for, for individuals. Senator? And the Office of uh, Preparedness and Response <coughs> is in the Health Department. I believe so. David, can you correct me if I'm wrong? You're correct. It's in the Health Department. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on to uh, housing support. The, um, this would be $25 million to uh, the rental services program that's within the Department of Housing and Community Development. They would be required to pay for housing debt of individuals and also provide up to 30 grants for 30 days of emergency housing. So this is like a good example of where I know we've all heard a lot of need in this area um, and $25 million may not sound like a huge number. But uh, at, in the latest stimulus plan, uh, $402 million has been dedicated for this. So this is one of those examples of where we're trying to balance what, what we believe is already out there with filling some gaps and, and adding some assistance. Senator Alford. Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a lot of questions today. Uh, on that point, uh, do we have any indication from the governor's office how they plan on getting that $402 million from the feds on the street as quickly as possible? Any indication? We Mr. Do. Chairman, I can give a partial answer if it's okay? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so um, for jurisdictions that have 200,000 or more population, the federal money is flowing directly to those counties into Baltimore City. Okay. So that's like 140, 150 million went directly to the to like eight jurisdictions. There's, there's an over 200 million that has come to the Department of Housing and Community Development, and they are working on a plan on how they will allocate that money. And hopefully, they should either do a budget amendment, and supposedly they're going to come talk to you all before they do that, or put it in a supplemental budget. But we have not seen any details from them yet on how they're going to use the state share of the money. Evidently, the governor made an announcement that for the smaller counties, there's going to be some sort of a work group, and they're going to involve uh, some legislators in that um, so that we can have a role in it. Senator Eckert. Thank you. That was going to be my next question. Are we going to absolutely overwhelm some of our small jurisdictions who are I mean, we have some that are set up ready to go with a lot of this, but we have others that may be struggling a little bit with it. So there will be a mechanism to work that out, right? Apparently. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Moving on to paragraph 30, uh, also related to housing. This, this is in relation to evictions. This would be $3 million that would flow through the administrative office of the courts to provide a grant to the Maryland Legal Services Corporation, who would then use the money to provide assistance to individuals facing eviction. And getting there. Um, paragraph 31 is in relation to community colleges. Um, this money would go to the Maryland Higher Education Commission uh, to increase resources of community colleges to offer to offer services to students or members of the community who are seeking training or other assistance to improve job skills or re-enter the workplace. I believe the intent is for this to follow the same formula as the CADE formula, and so we're we're working on on basically directing that that um, either this is this is the CADE formula or we will make sure that it follows the CADE formula. Yeah, we will need to adjust that Senator. And I only had a question because um, in reference to BCCC, I don't believe that they're associated with uh, the KEP of it. So just making sure it is still inclusive with them. Oh. That's my next comment is, is to include them, we would draft language that um, they would get the same, this money would be distributed proportionally to how total state aid is going to the local community colleges and BCCC. So they would each get a proportional share of this as they do in current law. Th thank you, Erica. Great. So we'll let Erica come up with the language that will we'll correct this, and, um, and we'll move on. Yep, we're going to do that change. Uh, paragraph 31. Um, this one would be... Um, 
a million dollars that would flow through juvenile, the Juvenile Services Education Program uh, within the State Department of Education, and they would be required to enhance educational services provided to children in the juvenile services system. And as you know, uh, we have uh, students obviously in detention facilities, and while they're there, they need to continue with their education, and this is related to that. So I'm going to bounce here because I want to explain all the grants together. Um, so we're going to move down to, and then we'll come back to the structure of the fund. But we'll move down to um, Section 8 at the bottom of page 11. And here, this authorizes the governor to um, process a budget amendment to transfer money out of the blueprint fund. So, so the money would come uh, from the blueprint fund. And there, there would be $50 million to county boards of education for, um, uh, for, for purposes related to summer school and tutoring uh, during the summer. And then, um, and then another $50 million for, for the boards of education to use towards uh, moving towards um, delivering in-person uh, education. And you'll see language in each of these paragraphs that talks about how to proportionally distribute this among the counties. Um, the first one is the based on the free and reduced price meal count among each county. And the second one is just total enrollment. And that gets us through how the money is going to be used. Um, moving back to, to uh, page 11. Subsection 8 is stock language requiring the treasurer to hold the money. Subsection I was something um, that's been asked for about all the grants, I think, and, and that ensures that any money provided here is supplemental to and will not supplant uh, any other money provided elsewhere to the program. Um, and then J is designed to allow the legislature to have some, um, some oversight or, or at least knowledge of what's going on and this would be a, um, um, a two-week reporting requirement. While these programs are open, DBM would have to come back to the legislature and give a, a report every two weeks um, on items one and two, um, basically uh, whether, whether the money actually did get transferred into the fund and then how the money is being spent out of the fund. And just so you know, we'll need to do a little bit of a technical amendment here um, just to make sure that we incorporate the education funds that are under Section 8 into this same reporting structure. Senator Rosepeth. Yeah, um, this is a terrific provision. I mean, it's very, very important. Um, my question, I guess, is does this reporting provision cover 100% of everything that is in this bill or only some of the things that are in this bill? That's my question. Well, once we, once we attach the amendment, the technical amendment Erica just suggested, it would cover everything, everything we just talked about in the bill. Okay. Well, then I want to raise the question of, it talks about individuals or organizations served by the program. And this is just a technical off the top of my head issue. I presume they're not going to report to us the individuals who got the $1,000 for unemployment insurance, because I don't think that's public information. Or maybe it is, but I didn't think that's public information. I'm not sure how they would handle that reporting requirement. Um, does David, do you know how the Department of Labor reports unemployment insurance statistics now? Is it? I assume it's not on the individual basis. I, I assume it's all aggregated. I mean, I've never seen anything other than just aggregated how much money they've spent. Right. Okay. That's the reason I raised the question. Is yeah. I think this provision needs to be tweaked a little bit. Thought through in terms of there's some differences in the program. We we do want a lot of information on unemployment insurance in particular, what's going on with it, but I don't think it's like the words here that talk about the individuals served by the program. Okay. So I just ask you to think about that. Thank you. And I believe that gets us through the amendment that you have requested. Do we want to take care of this amendment? And I, I believe um, there was reference to um, Senator Griffith having an amendment, too, right. we can go over. Right. Um, okay. Any... Um, oh, I, Senator? You can't... You're not getting... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. I didn't see it. No problem. Senator Zucker. Thank you. I just had a, a question about... Um, 
subsection, I guess, number eight. Um, first of all, thank you very much for prioritizing those individuals with learning disabilities um, and the most at risk because this uh, digital learning has been very difficult on all. I was just wondering if, um, and this, this is more of a question for, for our uh, wonderful staff, are the MANSEF schools, those schools that, that help, uh, that are non-public but are publicly funded, those that help special needs students, would they be included in any of the education relief that's been included in this wonderful piece of legislation? I, mean, I think we'd have to clarify that because those are technically non-public schools. So. So if that's the committee's desire, we can adjust the language to do what, so. I don't remember back from the many charts that we've been looking at. They, they would have been eligible for what through CARES? That I don't know particularly. Um, we'd have to get yeah, back to on that be, one unless yeah, David knows. they would certainly knows. be eligible for the PPE. But um, it's a good question. It's a good point, Senator. Um, hmm. um, I think that's going to take a little more work than we can do at the moment, but might be worthy of a, an amendment. Uh, a committee amendment on the floor if we need to do it. Uh, Senator Zucker. Sorry, I uh, faulty finger, Mr. Chairman. Oh. Sorry. Senator Eckert. Were some of those special uh, non-public schools eligible for either the idle funds or PPE? And I get them mixed up, the ones that were worked through the local banks, because I know I know of several that we're able to get some assistance with that. I think we're going to need to do a little work on that. Yeah. Okay. I had an additional question. Please. Uh, was there any thought about additional funds for broadband? And the reason I say that, I know there was a lot of money that came down to be able to help the hot spots, but in our area, we're still, we still have major connection issues. We're trying to work on that from a number of different, um, I guess, interventions or strategies. Um, but the hot spots got overloaded pretty quickly, um, and it created a lot of issues. So whatever we can do to be able to assist that connectivity, I think, is going to be really strategic um, for us, particularly in the rural areas, but I know there are areas in the metropolitan areas as well that need that help. I mean, that's an ongoing investment that will serve us well, well beyond this experience, so. Yes, um, I could say two things. One, and, and David, you're gonna have to fill in some gaps here because I know that there are, uh, there is money for that. Um, but let me just say in context, again, um, that's sort of a uh, infrastructure thing that um, probably not quote doable for in the in the time frame to to, to June um, to to use that money and make it significant. But there is money in other forms uh, for this. Uh, David, right? I didn't actually hear the the original question. The, what what program are we talking Broad, about? Broadband. 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 Yeah, I mean, there's 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 various things going on in the federal bill related to broadband. Um, there's they're giving assistance through the FCC to the broadband companies who provide um, for low or low cost or free broadband to customers who are you know disadvantaged. Um, there was education money that went to the school systems from the CARES Act that the governor allocated about I think 100 million for broadband and technology for the students to make sure they had access. So there, there are other, other things going on to help with broadband or for students. Senator Rosette. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, S Senator Eckert, I totally share your pain. And it's correct, as David said, that there is money coming in under the CARES money 
and the governor's put some money out there, and it's not enough. And it's not addressed in here because this is focused very much on the short-term relief sort of stuff. The big picture, though, I think, and I think there are going to be a couple of bills coming in this session dealing with this. You may be sponsoring one of them, but I've been hearing about a variety of bills to move the ball forward. I think the big opportunity, actually, on broadband is that the new administration in Washington is intending to propose as part of their infrastructure. Infrastructure to them does not just mean transportation. It means broadband. And so they're going to come in with a very, very major broadband proposal, probably not for several months. I think the key for Maryland, which is why our state legislation is important, is we've got to have our act together so that we're prepared to be, have shovel-ready broadband uh, to be able to take advantage of that. And I think that's where we should focus our energy. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Edwards. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, is there some of these are going to go to individuals, some are going to go to nonprofits? The money I'm talking about is going to be given out. We want to do this quickly. Is there an assumption that if someone gets some of this money and they don't use it the way it's supposed to be used, is it assumed there's a penalty? I mean, is that under the broad law that if they don't use, you know? They don't use it the way they said they were going to use it and wasn't intended. Is there some penalty clause in this bill or some something that says, you know, we're going to, you got to pay it back or you got to, we're going to slap your hand or whatever? So there isn't a, a penalty clause in this bill. And David, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, through my work with the bond bills, whenever agencies give money out, there, there usually is a grant agreement or some enforcement mechanism that says, okay, this is how you're going to use the money. And it's that agreement that then would be enforceable between the agency and the recipient of the money. So if the money goes and is used for some other purpose or uh, is, uh, if, if it comes to light that it was, I'm, I'm not sure how much, how much follow-up is happening, but if it comes to light that there's an issue with how the money was being used, I think it would fall back to the grant agreement between the grantee and the um, and the administering agency. Is that correct, David? That's normally true. I, I do not know what the Department of Commerce has been doing with all the grant money it's been giving out. Um, and certainly, you know, the both in this bill and in, in some of the governor's stimulus, money went to the counties, for example, to give to the restaurants and give to the hotels. So I don't know. I have not seen what what accountability measures that were on the counties to report back to the state and then what the counties did um, in terms of when they gave it out to individual uh, businesses. So uh, we can investigate that further, but I, I, I don't want to say definitively that that's true in every case. Okay. Um, further questions? Now I'll take a motion on this amendment as, as uh, amended in principle uh, throughout the process this morning. Second. Um, all those in favor, raise your hand. Okay. We appear to be unanimous. Um, okay. I believe we have a yep, question I'm, from Senator McCray and an amendment from Senator Griffin. Right. Um, go ahead, Senator McCray. Why don't we do deal with your question first? And everybody, there's been a little bit of trouble hearing, so just get a little closer with your mic if you can. I think it was in reference to local government and the impact on local government in reference to the 185 that was in the original fiscal note and what we have now. So I believe that that refers to the. Um, the uh, the subtraction modification the income tax exemption for um, unemployment insurance benefits because both the state and county use the same definition of taxable income when you remove the um, um, those payments from the uh, the determination of what's taxable it affects both the state income tax and the county income tax so there there's a flow through it, there's a flow through effect to the counties um, I would note that that the the inflated um, the, the number you're seeing is is inflated because of the inf the um, the extra unemployment insurance benefits that have have uh, been paid over the last year or two. Um, the uh, going forward, the the amount the of lost revenue to the counties is reduced. Got it. And 
I only asked because I saw the second document that came out from Kim, and it was dealing with the local income tax revenue account, and my local jurisdiction was texting me about that. Okay, so that piece is different, and that's, Two different the, things. that's the one that we, we have the billion dollars, over a billion dollars in, and it's sort of a, it's a revolving, revolving fund, um, and we're taking that $100 million out, and I think that's the nature of Senator Griffith's amendment. Okay, so you all, okay, got it. All right, didn't know. Okay, Senator Griffith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try, and then I think Matt can help me if there's a need for background or clarification. Colleagues, you should have in your email account, I think uh, Kim sent it out at the beginning of this meeting, a, a proposed amendment that would have the comptroller uh, perform a cash flow analysis of the local income tax reserve account for each month starting in April of this year through September 30th of 2022 to determine how much of the balance is needed to make, make the income tax distributions to local jurisdictions during that time and how much can be used to support COVID-related expenses. It requires that the report would be submitted to the Budget and Tax Committee, Appropriations, and MACO, um, and starting April 1st, 2021, an updated uh, report would be submitted in January of 2022. Okay. So I would move that amendment. Second. All right, everybody understand this is a reporting requirement, and I mean I think it's a it's a comfort level reporting requirement. Um, we have tapped into this fund over the years at various times. This is um, this is going to sort of codify that we we're we're going to um, be even more careful than we've been in the past and um, verifying the nature of the cash flow. And the nature of the revolving nature of the fund, so ensure that we're we are doing um, uh, the best that we can to ensure that we're not causing any harm. So, all right. All in favor? Uh, hands. Uh, again, we are unanimous. Um, and at that point, I think we are at final passage. Any further questions on the bill in its entirety as we have amended it, both in actual and in concept? Okay. Is there a motion? No move. Okay. All those in favor of the bill as presented? As, as uh, amended, excuse me. Unanimous, okay. Unanimous, yet again. Okay. Okay. Um, that was really good work, uh, everybody. Yep, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, we moved uh, very quickly, um, and I think we, we produced a product that is very, uh, is going to be very helpful to a lot of people. So we should all be... Uh, be proud for, of, uh, of this moment and what, what, what we're doing. So, um, and, and it's really a great thing that we were all able to do it together. And I'm very grateful to each one of you um, for joining in together to make this happen. So, does someone have a question? Senator. Mr. Chairman. Yep. Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to thank you for your leadership on these two very important and historic bills today. I think uh, the committee has a lot of work, a lot to be proud of, and just thank you so for your extra time and effort in making sure that we got these both before the committee today, and the staff. Thank, thank, thank you. you, thank you. All right, everybody. Um, we'll. Uh, what do we have? Hearings to what's tomorrow. tomorrow? No, we're on the floor tomorrow. Subcommittee. Okay. Okay. All right. So, uh, subcommittee chairs, why don't you tell me what's going on? Well, Sorry. Health and Human Services will be meeting at 1:30 today. You all should have received last night a copy of your budget analysis. We'll be dealing with um, three or four budgets today jointly with the House Appropriations Subcommittee on Health. 1.30 virtually, and you should have the Zoom link in your inbox. Uh, Education Business Administration. 
administration will be meeting today at 1.30 virtually. We'll have uh, three budgets uh, joint with uh, Education, Economic Development, House Appropriations. PST uh, 1.30 virtually, um, and we'll be joint with the House also. Okay. And one final word um, that uh, I would be remiss if I didn't say, um, getting all this done, um, if, we could, if we didn't have the staff we had, it wouldn't have happened either. So every one of the staff members, I know, I know that uh, they were up late. I know for a fact that Matt was up late working on this amendments uh, last night. And, uh, and I know everybody uh, on the team has been pitching in. And Kim and everybody, um, we're, uh, we're very grateful. So thank you all.